Hi, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Ask a Deaf Doula. My name is Suzanne O'Brien. Today, we are starting our series called Good Grief, and it is going to be a series of podcasts to help with grief and bereavement and to give tips and to bring on experts in that area to help give tools to people to learn how to go through the grief and bereavement and to do that well. So right now we're living in a time frame where we're not even addressing end of life and we're not doing the grief either. So very important because each and every one of us is affected by that. So today we have a very special guest. This is Michelle Hoffman. Michelle, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. You are welcome. We're like coast to coast today. So New York and California, I love that. <laughs> From coast to coast, we're gonna talk about end of life. So I'm just gonna let you guys know a little bit about Michelle and then we will get into our wonderful podcast. So Michelle Hoffman is the best-selling author of Life Worth Living. And she's the creator of the process for transitioning major life role changes to living a full and happy life. As in the case of becoming a widow and sole parent, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Transitioning her professional consulting to a more personal one, Michelle has been coaching families through logistics and emotions after loss since 2016. Her clients have recognized the value of a strong coach during a vulnerable time, giving them the solid results they need to create a life worth living rather than crumbling under the pressure of grief. You might see her out in California somewhere, running with her dog, good for you, and living a life um, full. So we really wanna hone into this. And I love the fact that you are addressing this specific part of grief and bereavement, um, which is critically important because in addition to losing somebody that we love and feeling that grief and bereavement when somebody has had the, the benefit of living a full life, um, if it's where you have small children and you find yourself the sole parent and the sole breadwinner on top of the grief, what do you do? And I, in your, you know, that statement there we read, instead of crumbling under the grief, which seems like maybe the only option and the only emotion that's available. So welcome, Michelle, and let's dive right in. So thank you for being here. This is such an important topic to cover. And I just loved when I got to meet you and your energy is wonderful. So let's really dive into this. But in the beginning, can I just ask you what brought you to a place of writing a book like this? What, what, brought, what made you want to do that? During our... Uh, my late husband's cancer journey. Um, fortunately, we have a group of a community, family, loved ones who would reach out and say, how is everything going? Mm -hmm. And what happened was I would be on the phone all day explaining and I realized I need to preempt this. So I started writing emails that were, um, I'm a business writer primarily, but these were emotionally based. Mm -hmm. And these emails gave updates on what was happen happening medically, but also gave insight into how are we telling our children about this major issue that has now come into our family where their father is no longer going to be the strong one. Mm -hmm. And what do they do when they're feeling weak and insecure? And, you know, how are they supposed to behave? And so these email updates... Um, I started to write them based on how we were feeling, like a roller coaster. One was mm -hmm. like song lyrics from the 80s or, you know, the platform of systems check in computers because my late husband was an IT guy. So they became interesting and valuable. And I was getting feedback from the community. There were over 300 families who said to me, this needs to reach a wider audience because mm -hmm. we're getting so much from it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how the... I got the idea to send that out. But once he had passed, you know, I'm lying in bed in a fetal position, soaking the pillow going, oh my God, what do I do? And all I could think was like, roll over to the other side and soak the pillow over there. And I'm like, this isn't serving anyone. So that's what not to do. And, you know, it was like, well, I'm going to need to get two full-time jobs or write a book and start a business and be the guide that I did not have. Mm. And so that's actually 
actually how the book idea came. Mm -hmm. um, I found myself at the kitchen table with Guy Kawasaki, amazingly enough, um, the fellow who evangelized Apple Computer, Steve Jobs, I'm friends with his wife. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he, I was telling him the story about how, you know, I had pulled my life together after loss and restabilized the children. And then a high school friend of mine went out for a run, and I used to run with this guy, and he had a heart attack and died. Ooh, and I yeah. thought, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And I realized, oh my God, I do know what to do. And I can't do nothing. So I went and got Chinese food and brought it to his widow. That's what you do. And I said, this is never going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I will hold my hand and walk this journey with you. Mm -hmm. Let's project manage this thing. And all the mourners in the living room were like, phew, somebody's going to take the lead. And um, that's actually what started my idea for this, because then I was sent out to help other people going through major life role changes like widowhood in the same way. And I realized I, I really need to write this book as my legacy heart gift to the world before I die. And yeah. So I Good for you. Love it. Um, so very, there's so many similarities in the work that I do and what you're speaking of, meaning that we don't talk about death as a society, we don't prepare for it. So when it comes at any time, and I deal with hopefully people who have lived a full life, but not always, um, it's just a mess because people don't know the first thing about what to do. And you're explaining the same thing. Now people are in like the middle of their lives or find themselves again, losing their spouse um, earlier with, you know, kids and all that, but they don't know the first thing to do and it must be completely overwhelming. And I find that when we're overwhelmed, we can't function at all. So there's many different dynamics here and just having somebody say, take this step forward, take this step forward. Um, but I think that, and we can talk about this. I think that it's also very important to understand that there's no, um, one way to do this. There's no time schedule. It's different for everybody. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that even having this next step is wonderful, but it has to be when that person is ready to take that step. Right. Grief, as you were pointing out, and it could be pre-grieving also. There's no word in the English language mm -hmm. for when the your loved one who you're about to lose is comforting you for their loss mm -hmm. um I, and if anyone of the listeners know that please tell us what that word is or we need to come up with a word for that and grief is complicated it's mm -hmm. ambiguous it's mm -hmm. grief roams the house and smothers the children in their sleep and when you're trying to get something done grief slams your head against the wall and throws you to the kitchen floors, puts its foot on your neck and prevents you from breathing or seeing your future. It's really hard at that point to say, oh, sure, I got it all. I can figure it out because you're like, oh. So there's, you know, a few steps to get through grief and it's in each person's time. Mm -hmm. One, you have to be ready to adjust your relationship with grief. Mm -hmm. And identify what grief holds for you. And because grief, some people don't want to let it go. And there's a treasure in there. And they're afraid if they loosen the grip on grief, then they might forget this loved one or not honor them in such a way. So it's really identifying what grief holds for you and assessing how that can move you forward rather than keeping you stuck by honoring the relationship and love that was there in the, mm -hmm. in whatever grief was holding for you. And if it feels like a cliff, it's, it's too much too fast because really you want one small step at a time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did was I wasn't really a bed maker. I mean, okay. You know, truth is coming out here, but I realized mm -hmm. at some point I need to get out of the bed and I would just make the bed. So now I'm yeah. a bed mate, because that yeah. meant it would take one more step to get into it. And if that's all I could do, that's all I could do. Yeah. Um, because it sucks all the energy out of you. And even if you were like a go-getter dynamo, you need to rebuild all of that energy. 
and it's happening to the kids too. Yeah. So, so let's start, let's start at square one talking about what grief and bereavement actually is. And I love the fact of switching our relationship with it because you, first of all, I feel like there is gifts in everything, which there are. This is a very natural process. And I think people have to understand that this is a natural part of the process and that it is expected and it is okay and it is on your time frame. It's not two weeks and you need to get over it. It's not any of that. But what about when you say the grief strangles you, I can't get air in. What about if we can make friends with the grief and peace with the grief? So first let's talk to our listeners about and, and this podcast about what is grief. So let's give them a definition of grief and bereavement and then let's take that journey on becoming friends with it and seeing the value in it, if we may. Okay, so grief is an, it's an emotion, mm -hmm. and uh, what so often, especially in this time frame, we're told that we're only allowed to have one emotion at a time, mm -hmm. like, and everyone wants us to be happy, be happy, don't cry. They say don't cry. Well, <laughs> cry, if we, we cry. <laughs> If we could just be told what not to do and what to do and we could actually do that, okay, that's a one way to live life, but it's not necessarily a really deep life experience. Mm -hmm. And we do have more than one emotion that we can feel at a time. Mm -hmm. So grief in part is actually honoring um, yeah. whatever grief holds for us. So I might just be as sad as could be because my late husband is not here to watch my children go through these amazing growth opportunities and life mm -hmm. celebrations. So mm -hmm. it's a really uh, double-sided event when I see them doing something and accomplishing and going, wow, your dad's missing out on this and he would be so proud of you for this. So, so it's important for people to know that grief will come and go and it will come when you least expect it probably too. You know, comes, even years later, yeah. In, I, in my experience and what mm -hmm. I've shared with my clients is um, if you can create a vision, align it with your authentic self and develop mm -hmm. um, in, incremental steps, like doable steps to create your own legacy, whatever that is, mm -hmm. it actually helps you move through the grief process so that you're not uh, overwhelmed by it all the time. So it's not like I will, I will never, uh, you know, let go of the love that I had for my husband and that we brought these two children into the world and all of the wonderful times that we shared and growth together. However, I'm definitely moving forward if I'm going to use myself as an example. Mm -hmm. And those grief moments, I still fall into them, but I bounce back very fast. Sure. Yeah. So I'm not stuck in them. And that's one of the things that I can teach people. So they are honoring grief and living it and seeing and identifying the values of the emotions that go along with it and all the life experience that comes with that sure. to, like I said, help you move forward to live a full and happy life on your own to, because there's more to life than just being the one who didn't die. You're still here. Fulfill amazing things and you know appreciate your one precious life and mm. it makes decision making super simple because we do not waste time on things that are not yeah. absolutely in line with our purpose and vision and mission and then to support the children on theirs and making well, sure yeah. that and that is one of the gifts of the reality of death which we're missing in our society right now is that when we when we treat it like something that's optional or that it you know it doesn't happen or it happens in a closeted room we're missing just what you said the not sweating the small stuff by going for the passion by aligning with our purpose and nothing else and that is a fast track to to a great life Right. And some people yeah. don't know how to create that. So again, sure. I have exercises that I work with clients to help them identify what's right for them. It's not me. Sure. I'm not yeah. living my life, I'm not living mine, but it's to identify what works for them and what's going to be, what's going to make the biggest impact by them uh, being present in sure. this time. Yeah. Uh, 
there are things we, you were talking about bereavement mm -hmm. and there are different kinds of losses in our life. Mm -hmm. It could be the loss of a community when you move. It could mm -hmm. be loss of a job and a self-identity or a career and you're changing that. It could right. be- Physical functioning. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, absolutely. Oh my God. As well, we age, yes. As we there's age, there's a lot of that. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a really good one to go a little deep dive on, because it's really, how do you find the fullness where you're at? Um, so, you know, speaking with end of life doula mm -hmm. references, mm -hmm. when my late husband could go for a long walk, we would do that then end of the block, then end of the driveway, then we'd sit in the sun, or I would pull the oxygen out and so he could sit in the sun out that way. And when none of that was available, we would do virtual reality goggles and I would tell stories or I would pull. What I, yeah. One of the things I did was I made a list of things we love in mm -hmm. case I would forget them when I was really sad. Yeah. And I yeah. needed them. Yeah. And I made a list of, I call them, remember that time when. Yeah. And we had pages and pages of these and I cut them out into little strips of paper and I put them in a black bag. And when things got really tough, I would mm. pull out a remember that time when. Yeah, and it would nice. Memory and story that we could then share. Beautiful. And that was, that was nice. Also, it's nice for the kids to have. For uh, sure. And it's available at any time, anywhere for us. So let's, all right. So let's start with some pathways to how we can be proactive and help people. So first, I think people have to know that grief is expected. It's natural. It is yours. It's on your own time frame. that there's no right or wrong way to grieve, but it's important to grieve and to honor that place. And somebody had said something really beautiful is that the level of grieving sometimes, because it can be so painful, is that's how much love you have for that person. And so isn't that gorgeous that you're, you're in this place of such pain, but that's how much love and connection you had. So it's kind of like a testament to that love, which is great, but we want to be able to process that and to get back to a place. So that being said, I, and I know that you're gifting everyone with your book, which is so wonderful. So thank you so much for that. We'll tell them how to access that at the end, but let's talk about techniques of what you can do. So the top 10 things that you need to do to avoid losing your assets, job, and children. So that's one of the things that's covered um, underneath uh, your book is going to have a lot of that, but let's talk about some of those techniques. So techniques to support grieving children in the four areas where children are most vulnerable, peer groups, family units, school, and community. So let's talk about that, that person who finds themselves, and this can be a female or a male, um, a mother or a father that can oh, find absolutely. themselves in this space. So let's talk about somebody who, let's just use that man who had a heart attack, that instantly you find yourself in the throes, which does happen. Um, what can we do in that instance? Number one, for the person, what should they do? And usually I just say breathe and pause and like support, but let's also talk about the kids, the children at this moment, because we don't want to, we don't want to leave a lot of space in that time frame, and we want to know what we can do to support them. So let's talk about that. Okay. Um, all right. So in that instance, I mean, that was a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was a real event. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was talking with, the widow of my friend and she was saying, and the book is really a love letter to her. Mm -hmm. um, and she was saying, you know, I was only planning dinner. Yeah. You know, she, she's, you know, very capable mother and parent and wife and community member. And she's got so much going on. And she's like, I was only planning dinner and now I'm planning a community wide event due to the loss of my spouse. Right. And, um, I mean, that's a big change of direction in one afternoon, <laughs> you know? I would say. I would say. So um, some of the things that we can do before we're in that situation right. is protect your family and fiscal life. And like the top things to do that, you know, oh, we'll get to it when we feel like it. Mm -hmm. Update your will and mm -hmm. beneficiary. Really mm -hmm. put some thought into who mm -hmm. would be the right to care yeah. for your children if you're yeah. not there. Yeah. And we were talking about restabilizing kids. My kids were like clinging to me after my husband had passed. 
And I couldn't get them out of my bed. I couldn't get them to school. I couldn't, I mean, that's normal. It's like we lost yeah. a parent. We, we don't want to lose you too. Yeah. So one of the things that I did was I did what I call life in reverse. And um, I secured the right people who would take care of them in the event of my, mm -hmm. you know, untimely passing. Mm -hmm. And I put things in place. I have, we did an ethical will. And that's okay. not the legal stuff, but it's really creating letters to our loved ones. And these are when they graduated elementary school, junior high, high school, at their bar and bat mitzvah, some big life events. Mm -hmm. When you're really pissed at your mom, when no one understands you, your first kiss. Uh, when your heart mm -hmm. is broken the first time, when you think you found the right person to marry, on your wedding day, when you have children, when your mother has joined me. So it's like, ugh. but the children know that they have messages from their father. They will have messages from me um, going wow. forward. So the voice is still present. Yeah. Um, so an ethical will is a beautiful gift and I can walk people through that. Uh, so someone to care for the children, an ethical will, updating beneficiaries, a trust, uh, that's a legal entity to assign mm -hmm. an appropriate person to handle those things with power of attorney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And please, advanced medical directives. Mm -hmm. So I, I have put my people at a table. You are in charge of, you know, my, me and my body. You're in charge of the children. Yeah. You're, taking, you're in charge of education. And my kids know who these people are. And it really helped them yeah. loosen their on me to sure. feel more surprised. Yeah. Um, talk about how kids are not responsible for the loss of a parent or a loved one. And oftentimes they do somehow. So mm. letting them know they didn't do this, they're not responsible for the death of a loved one and that they don't have to fill that person's shoes. You know, mm. my right. performance was like, I'm the man of the house. Yeah. Um, that's not necessary. Yeah. <laughs> I will fill that role. Yeah. You be the best you that you can be and it took all this responsibility off of him like he really thought he was supposed to fill his father's shoes well sure if he's so only he, male yeah um so those conversations that we think maybe we don't need to have we actually just need to make it super clear um and it's also important to remind them that they need to get involved in the world again um, and that could be, I mean, if you have no ideas, I say something with big motor skills, fine motor skills and intellectual stimulation. So mm -hmm. soccer, art, and chess would be an example. Um, when we go through- and, it, these, and it's okay, it's okay to laugh and be happy. Like I think some people talk about being guilty about, feeling guilty about that. There's a, um, a mystique or you know the widow for example mm -hmm. uh i went to four funerals the week that my husband passed my best friend my great aunt then my husband passed his funeral and it was our uh, wedding anniversary just to add all of it in there and then my uncle well my uncle's funeral one of my cousins came up to me and said i was happy to see her i'm like ah! and she said what are you smiling about you're a widow mm. and I'm, Ooh, that's a lot of black and tears to wear in a week. I was really wow. happy to see. That. And so it reminded me that we can have more than one emotion and it is important to have yeah. them yeah. and to let the other people's opinions on what our life should be go so that we can pursue our own life. They don't have the whole story and they're going to bring as much love as they can they're going to say the wrong thing, but they're going to intend it well. It's important to recalibrate relationships, which is a big deal mm -hmm. because people don't know how to behave and we need to tell them. So, Here are my so let's tell them right now, because this is what I find when people get a terminal diagnosis or people die. Mm -hmm. People don't know what to say. So they do sometimes say the wrong thing at, with good intention or they avoid people. So what can they do? What would have helped you or what did help you that people could do in your time of crisis right at the beginning? Um, and, and people did do the right mm -hmm. things. Um, it's actually a real ninja skill to get this right. It really is. Um, not trying to make it better because mm -hmm. it's 
gone. Don't try it. Don't try and fix it. Yeah. Right. Death is part of life. Mm -hmm. So let's um, embrace it and love it and make it loving and tender and as beautiful if we can as birth, you know, and, you know, don't try to make it okay or fix it, but say, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss is actually really, really good. Then there's the, what can I do? Exactly. This is the craziest question. Um, So this is where I'm saying it takes a superpower ninja skill to know the asker well enough to be able to say, you know what, you may not have resources, but maybe our kids could play together and you could watch them while I have some downtime or do something or just cry for a little bit. Um, Maybe this person can walk the dog. Maybe they do have a resource and they can help bring food or help with something. And I was like, at, at the funeral, I'm like, I really need staggered love. And I wanted to put a calendar out for like the next 10 years and everybody there pick a week and just touch stone with us on that week. Love it. And I didn't do it. I'm going to try and figure out a way to provide staggered love for people. Yeah. I love, uh, I love it. Even when we had stabilized, you know, on day, the first I was, Oh, I felt so guilty. I'm like, I really want that first year of widowhood to be over with so that I can be back on my feet. And it's a misconception. The first year is actually just you pulling yourself back on your feet. But I thought I'd be, I got this now. And it's really, you know, you get to a developmental phase that could happen faster than a year or longer. And then you're like, ah, or you could hire a widow guide to expedite the whole process. And that's when you pull life together and put it back on track. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, you know, what can you do in prep for yourself, for the kids and to reach out to the community when you're feeling these big emotions, Mm -hmm. you know, your body produces oxytocin, which is the cuddle drug and actually encourages, encourages you to reach out and bring community in. And finding what they, people have a bounty of that they will not feel taken advantage of by asking for is really the right way to ask for help. I'm a giver. It's really hard to ask for help. But if yeah. I have a lemon tree and you want lemons, yes, you I get as hard. many as you want. They're just, I, so it's yeah. really to find bounty. I think it's hard and for then, everyone to ask for help for so many people today. We're just, really, yeah. But we all love to be givers. Well, so. but yes, but but we need like the strength in is in asking for help or receiving that help because we all need it. We're human beings. So I think the things that we want to emphasize here is that when somebody has just lost somebody, that you're not here to fix it, but to show up. And also to know that you don't always have to say things. Right. To show up in your presence, but also something that's so helpful is to say, what can I do for you? Because it's going to be different for everybody, you know? And so that gives people back a sense of control when they feel, again, that their life has just been turned upside down. So I love that you said that. It's beautiful. Um, One love of the it. things they say is mm-hmm. take what you need, not more than what you need. Give uh-huh. what you can, not more than what you have. Yeah. And Giving people a sense of control in an out of control situation is a huge gift. Yes. One of the things Mm -hmm. that we do with the kids is I ask them, and this is good at any stage or relationship that you have. Mm -hmm. When we're having an interaction, would you like me to listen, guide, or help? Mm -hmm. And that puts somebody in a position where it's like, really, I just need to have someone hear my story. Yeah. Or yeah. Like with the kids, they usually start with just listen. And I, it's really hard for me to be like, mm-hmm, I, know. I will just listen because I have ideas. And then they go, okay, guide. And I say, I know you're going to do what you're going to do anyway. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my perspective and experience. I and think that's it's when I get so a important that you highlighted that because we all, I think it, with good intention, everyone just gives advice unsolicited unsolicited by the way and so we forgot about that person didn't ask but we're also taking more control away from them by just 
imposing what we think. So I thought that was just wonderful. Can you repeat those three things again that you would show up and say? Yes. Would you like me to listen, guide, or help? I love it. Beautiful. So empowering. That's so great. So for you, the guide is so wonderful, but it also has all those different facets. There's practical things, there's the financial piece, there's the emotional piece. So what would you advise initially to help someone to show up? Because there's all those different avenues and, and the practical really does have to be taken care of sometimes like right away. So for us right now, um, people die and people are like, well, we don't even know if he had an advanced directive or a will or like it's a scavenger hunt. So right. what do you advise people who are in that first stage? What are the practical steps do you ask to find out uh, about? The subtitle of my book is um, A Practical and Compassionate Guide to Navigating Widowhood and Soul Parent. Because yeah. so often we were, we're told, well, there's a reason I am a leader and there's a list of things you need to get done from ARP or mm -hmm. AAA might have a list, um, but it's really putting in place what you can and creating a plan. And I get what's the saying: if you plan, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, but we don't know to do this. Yeah. So really, there's seven aspects that I work with clients on, and I have widows. I have an equal number of widows and widowers, and or they may be people who have lost in other aspects of their lives. Um, and it's really about knowing the steps to achieve a worthy future, future for yourself and your children. Mm -hmm. Do you have all the financial and legal things in place? Um, resources and the right people to help propel you forward. Mm -hmm. uh, are you a role model for the kids? So how to become head of household and sole parent when you're accustomed to being a partner? Um, how to ensure that you've got career and resources and revenue coming in at a pace that's going to equal the life experience that you would like to be at. And I work with people from every background, social, gender, everything. And we all are having very similar experiences. Like I said, there's phases of widowhood. Um, you have to recalibrate relationships and make sure you've got your inspirational advisory board in place because one person can no longer be your everything. You've got subject matter experts, to go to, uh, emotional champions, and then leverage people who will leverage their position and accountability and network partners in place. All right, let's wanna, talk about that board. How do you, how do you how, let's talk about that board. How do you put that board together? Let's expand on that, because I think it's really interesting what you're saying. Okay, so when you're busy taking care of everything and everyone, who mm. is taking care of you? And that's a real deal because it's super easy to get to crumble underneath this. And just a reminder, you need to keep refueling your energy mm -hmm. because otherwise the care for the caretaker, I mean, mm -hmm. you know that better than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you're not going to have the energy and resource to take care of everyone else. Yeah. And more than your life is at stake now. Yeah. So yeah. vital. So Subject matter experts are the trusted mentors who help you make decisions, who have your best interest in mind. You cannot get milk from the cable guy. I mean, you, you know, you've got to ask the right people the right questions and stop where they are no longer the expert. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, let's, let's practice this out a little bit, Suzanne. Who would be someone who you know, who you who cares about you, who has some expertise in something? Well, I can take uh, my pick. So uh, let's just say I have, you know, uh, attorneys. I have business mentors. I have doc medical people. I have friends. Right. I have yeah, right. family. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you're talking with the doctor, would you ask your medical practitioner? about wealth advisor topics no. or business practices probably no. not but you will now that i've said it 
-hmm. What we tend to do is we start this line of questioning with people and we have this banter and then we go and we ask them a question that's outside their zone of genius. Yeah. And then they come back to us and give us a ridiculous answer or something or they have a judgment. Any sentence that starts with no judgment, but I'm like, oh, there's judgment after that. <laughs> that yeah. One. Yeah, um, not the but, not the but. Right, no judgment, but, and then here comes the judgment. So it's really knowing what somebody's scope and zone of genius is and sure. keeping them in that. Um, yeah. Educators, advisors, and for the children also, because the kids are gonna look to people for advice and you wanna make sure at school, for example, you know, one teacher might actually have a really amazing emotional ability to support and another one may not. And they, the kids need a plan in place where they can say, I'm going to go step out and talk with somebody, uh, you know, my counselor at the office so that they have a safe ground mm -hmm. um, so that they also have experts available to them at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. um, again, where it matters to them. And they have control over that. If they're like, I am not handling the personal narrative because the guy I was buddied up with just said, aw, you're sad because your dog died and your dad died and you have to write a personal narrative, Ah, You know, it's like, my kid's gonna be like, I gotta tap out for a minute. And yeah. to give them the breath to do that. So having the subject matter expert for, in that case, would have been the teacher to say, I understand going through, go talk to the counselor, go take a breath, come back. You still have to do the assignment, but you yeah. can do it without question. Yeah. All right. So emotional champions are next. Oh, these are really fun. Okay. So Suzanne, who do you have on your team? And you don't have to specify the person, but you've got someone in your life who will listen to you and always be on your side. Like you're going to be the, the sky is yellow or something ridiculous and they're going to be like yeah everyone else is wrong and you're right you're Do you know right. what i love michelle it's so funny you say that and i love that and it's so good to have people but for me it's not necessarily that everyone says that yes you're right in what you think it's that they have no judgment on nice. what i'm saying and i think that's really important for us to know that there is no judgment so i might say yes it's blue but you don't have to be like yeah everyone else is wrong it's saying it's blue and you're saying it's yellow but to say, okay, you know, sure. And totally just love me for who I am. Exactly. You know, exactly. I so love it. That's yeah. one kind of emotional champion, but there's another, okay. and I know you've got these two because okay. of who you are. Okay. And these people will be like, yeah, yeah. And then they're going to be like, no, we're going to challenge yeah. you to be on your best and never rest on your laurels and go, what are you thinking? You know, yeah. so those people will set you straight. Yeah, And they're brave enough and you know there's enough love between you that, you've, you that you can be like, yeah, no, you've got it wrong. You've got to reconsider this from a different aspect and maybe pivot one click on your attitude on that one. <laughs> so someone who will, you know, put it up in your face and go, uh -uh. Um, Then there's accountability and network partners. And these are people who help you stay on track. Um, so maybe it's like, uh, oh, okay, I've got a good one. Um, when, so during the whole hospice time, I was very present with my late husband. I had a minimum amount of time with him. I wanted to cherish every moment. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't really a big fitness pro at the time. Um, and so after he had, I literally had not been to the mailbox in months. Okay. And a friend of mine's like, I'm gonna run a half marathon. I'm like, oh, what are you running from? Would have been my attitude before. And then this time I'm like, I'm gonna do it with you. Never in my life have I taken a challenge like this. And it's been months and I've not gone to the mailbox. And she's looking at me like, you will? Okay, let's go. Yeah. And the first mile was brutal. The second yes. mile was brutal. Yes. The third mile was brutal. <laughs> and yeah. then and then I'm like, huh, this is kind of pretty cool. I can go out and do this now. Mm -hmm. And so my accountability partner was this person who said, let's go run, literally go run a half marathon. I mean, how many marathons are there in raising kids and end of life and working and all this stuff? And 
so we actually did it. I did not have to go fast. I have two speeds, slow and not quite as fast as that. But that was not the goal. That was get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And crossing the finish line, I'm like, I'm so alone. Why aren't you here? And I was like, oh, no, I am not as alone as I think I am. I am not. Mm -hmm. I had my friends with me. I have my support team. I have people who are cheering me on. Yeah. So you really not as alone as you think you are. But sometimes you need to be reminded. Yeah. Um, there's people in your advisory board who will connect you to the next right thing. If, I mean, for me, Guy Kawasaki was one who said, write that book. And he goes, you know, he's like, that's your book. And when Guy Kawasaki says, write the book, you write the book. But on the way home, I'm like, if I had gotten a job somewhere else and somebody had given me a huge assignment, I would have done it. Gut punch. Why didn't I tell Guy Kawasaki I wanted to write a book on amazing food and orgasms I've enjoyed all over the world? But that was not my life experience. This is. So that's what I wrote the book on. And as I started writing it, I actually met a coach who, through the author's incubator, it's a pretty mm -hmm. brilliant way to get a self-help book written, mm -hmm. um, supported me through the steps and guidance, just like guiding through widowhood. Um, expedites the whole process and is the accountability partner and they leverage mm -hmm. their position and experience to help you get where you need to go. And so I want to, you know, do the head nod to Dr. Angela Loria and the author's incubator who really helped me make sure that book got written. Yeah. Um, and then also leverage their position to help you maybe in your next career. If you didn't work before, but you need to work now. Right. Um, it's the people who will help you. I met a woman Oh my God, it was so heartbreaking. Um, she said, where were you when my sister needed you? Because her husband had passed. She had gotten a life insurance payout and she was grieving without any support structure or guidance. And we don't even know, you know, people didn't know there was a widow guide available until now. And she spent the money trying to appease her grief on vacations and trips and not things that would be, and good investments for her and her kids. And it's devastating because her kids felt orphaned and the son, uh, he died by suicide and the daughter mm. won't talk with them. And it's like, this, this breaks my heart because there is support and there are guides. So you do, you can create an inspirational advisory board to have the support you need to move forward and sure. to have a full and happy life. All right, so that leads me to one of the things that you have down. It says the reasons you get stuck in grief and how to get through it, because it sounds like this woman is a great example of that. Um, and I get the advisory boards absolutely, totally wonderful. And I also am a firm believer in don't reinvent the wheel. Find if anything that you're interested in, find who's doing it, do it better or do it differently or make it your own, but learn from that. But let's talk about why people do get stuck in grief. Why might they? Um, people can get stuck in grief because um, they don't want to change. It might bring them comfort and, you know, your brain literally tells you every day, if I, if I do exactly what I did yesterday, I stayed alive. So I'm just going to do that again today. And, you know, it's like, if that was just stay in bed and cry and soak the pillow, um, well, you know what? I'm just going to do that again today. And really, you have to be smarter than your brain <laughs> to get up and take that first small step. Um, people get stuck in grief because of external pressure. You've created a role. I mean, maybe you've been married to this person for years and years and you loved that role. Or even if you're not a bereaved widow, there are relieved widows. So people who are actually then freed from a situation because of the loss of their loved one, which is something we never wish on anyone, but you know, it's something that's so hard to move from or you just, one, it wipes all of your energy out. Mm. And where do you get the resource to be inspired to go, okay, I'm gonna write a book or <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pull it together and create whatever out of my life. 
um, it's safe to stay here and we're not, we're, um, we're taught how to acquire things in life. We're not taught how to let go. And so we need someone to teach us it's okay to let go. But like I said, we hold on to this because it's who we are. It's what we're accustomed to. When we go through traditions and life celebrations, I mean, here come the holiday seasons or, you know, it's at the latter part of the year and we're like, I'm exhausted and I still have year end goals to meet. And now I need to go through anniversaries or um, traditions and celebrations. And how do I do that without just being distressed with emotional grief and loss? It's like, huh. So people are afraid to move forward or they're afraid that the whoever they lost um, might disappear. And they don't mm -hmm. want to, they don't want to forget them, but you won't forget them. And there's techniques to that, to yeah. keeping that love alive. Even if you're ready to find love again as an overwhelmed full-time grieving widow parent. And there is hope for that. And mm -hmm. there are, you know, you, there are steps to take to make sure you're, uh, you're a new person and you're not trying to replace that person and you're welcoming somebody new into your life in the new shape that you're in. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So for, for our work as end of life doulas, I found that people can get stuck in their grief because they don't allow themselves to feel it, to go there, to have that depth. And the only way through on the other side is to really go through it. And so having permission to do that. And part of that is that end of life comes about so quickly because we're not preparing or shocking or even admitting that it's part of the journey that and then we go into the funeral and the whole thing that we don't even have any time to do that properly. And so you've got it, you've got to move through it and process it. So yeah, and, and maybe you're afraid of how bad that's going to feel, but it's not and it's just natural and it's got to get out somehow. So this leads me to how do we rebuild and how do we find our passion, legacy, journey for maybe the first time in our whole lives now that maybe we were the mother, the wife, that was our identity, the main breadwinner is not here anymore, it's me now. What do I do to come into alignment, to find my purpose, to create that legacy, which I love you talking about? Um, this is a really exciting thing to do. It it's is. So much fun. Yeah, yeah. And it's really hard to do it for yourself. Just like when people are talking about themselves, it's hard for us to compliment ourselves. It's so much more natural mm -hmm. to have somebody on the outside identify your superpower skills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if um, no matter who you are, or no matter how you've existed in this world, you have superpower skills that come naturally to you. Mm -hmm. And so to know what your natural abilities are, what your what and what you lose track of time doing. Mm -hmm. That's your passion right there. Mm -hmm. What do you lose track of time mm -hmm. doing because you're having so much fun doing it? Mm -hmm. What's your skill set? And then, you know, what's going to make a positive impact on the world or bring in revenue, depending on whatever it is that you, mm -hmm. you know, sort mm -hmm. of this intersection. Absolutely. And yeah. then we align your value system to that so that you're staying within your integrity and your authenticity. Because if you're trying to be something you're not, never works. So, and if you're only focused on money, it doesn't work either. So you have to, I agree, what, what brings you joy? What, is, what are the things that feed your soul? And then how do you make that into your offering profession to the world? And there's so many, what's exciting now is there's so many ways to think outside the box for things because of the internet. You know, I mean, yes, it's a crazy thing with Facebook and the connecting and never off of that. That's the danger part of it. However, there's so many opportunities to do just about anything from the comfort of your home too, right. Um, running. Right. So it's really amazing. And then having somebody be able to kind of guide you in that um, you'd be amazed. And with your passion comes success. So, so your financial things will all start to happen if it's in alignment with who your true self is. Um, and it's beautiful. So I love that. I've yeah. been managing um, 
I've been professionally, I've always been in a management role. Uh -huh. I love this because I can just see mm -hmm. what, what mm -hmm. inspires people and what lights them up. Yeah. You go, well, why would you be interested in doing more of that in whatever mm -hmm. role we're in? Mm -hmm. and, um, they're like, you would let me do that? And it's like, yeah, let's career path this thing for you. So I've catapulted so many careers. It is second nature to me to be able to see the superpower skills and go, hmm, do you see where the passion mm -hmm. and skill can actually be a new career for you that you had not considered? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's one of my favorite projects. It is, and I think it's just the favorite thing in life is helping people to find their passion, um, regardless of where they are, what their circumstances in, because every, you know, everyone or the majority of people have been living what society and other people have told them to do, to think, to be, and you see the unhappy, you see the heaviness, you see the waiting for Friday at five o'clock. That's not when life starts, by the way. Weekend goes very quick. <laughs> so if that's what you're waiting for, we've got a problem. You want to enjoy again every day to feel like you're not watching the clock. Um, and it's feeding your soul. So, all right, let's talk about your consulting for a bit. So you're going to graciously be giving the book away so you can share that and then also expand on what your consulting is and tell people how they can access that, please. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this big book as my heartfelt gift to the mm -hmm. world. It's the guide I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So you, all the listeners, all of your listeners, all the mm -hmm. end of life public care listeners are welcome to download a copy of my book as my gift, um, go to thewidowguide.com, T-H-E-W-I-D-O-W-G-U-I-D-E.com. So when you go to thewidowguide.com, you just press on the big button that says download this book now. And um, then you will have a copy of the book at thewidowguide.com. And then you can have the practical and compassionate guide to navigating widowhood and soul parenting. So you've got the tools you need. If the book is not enough, then still at thewidowguide.com, there's a place where you can contact me and you can set up time on my schedule. And I would love to share some time with you and talk about what's going on with you and see how we can come up with some really good solutions. And this is my gift, totally my gift. This is, I get to choose how I spend my time in my precious life. Mm -hmm. This is my gift and I get to do it. So people are like, how are you doing that? If at some point during that time, we together make mm -hmm. a decision on that call that we'd like to work together, then we can talk about that. Um, the book is my gift, my time and expertise and experience, both professionally and personally, my gift at guide.com. Love that. Thank you so much for that. I think that is really, really wonderful and beautiful. And you don't have to be a widow to take advantage of that. That's for anyone who wants to find their passion. Um, now is a great time. If you do have a question for Michelle or myself, please, you can write it in the chat box and we will make sure that we address it. We do have a question that had, was written into askadeathdoula at gmail.com about from somebody who wanted to ask, what could her and her husband put into place again? We kind of covered some of this. Um, but what can they do to alleviate it being a total train wreck? God forbid one of them does get caught in a situation where they don't have the other partner, the partner dies. What advice would you give us now that we should capitalize? Like maybe a, a, something simple or something that just is really digestible that we can all do now to ensure that security. It's the greatest gift you can give your surviving loved ones to think about this in advance. It really is. Yeah. And even if, you know, uh, we were talking about people don't know what to say and do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what to say or do, mm -hmm. somebody who's had a loss, mm -hmm. um, you can say, send them to me. And I will refer, you know, say you are valued and valuable. And that's, mm -hmm. they don't always know the right thing to say. And that's why they've sent you to me. Even if it's impending or, you know, inevitable. Um, so the quick list on this is to put a, make sure that you will. So the whole thing is about project management. Yeah. Prioritizing what to do when. And what you're asking is before all of this happens. So in the before all of it happens, 
um, is the time to put your will in place. Yeah. And identify beneficiaries. Develop this ethical will of mm -hmm. what are your values and what do you hope for in the world? Um, and it doesn't have to be for your children. It can be for, you know, people you care about who had some impact on your life. You know, send them, have a letter written or a video or something that can be sent out. Um, so do, taking care of the legal stuff, identifying people in place who will... Um, fill your shoes. I mean, you're never, no one's ever going to fill your shoes, but who, you know, build the inspirational advisory board now. Yeah. And like I have done for my kids so that they're feeling more stabilized and secure. If you're in fear, you can't learn in math class. You can't, <laughs> you just, learn, you can't learn anything if you're in fear. Or grief or any of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so to help stabilize them, those I think um, thinking it through, putting together the advanced medical directives and not just the legitimate, you know, stuff, but it's the also emotional. Yeah. Emotional stuff. How would you, I like you to care for me on my behalf? Um, so Even writing a letter, like, you know, God forbid something happened, just writing a letter of what you want people to know. Right. You know, ahead of time or where, you know, just a love letter, not uh, those love letters. So, so I love it. And even just thinking about this brings so much value to every single day of our lives. So, so important, but know you're not alone and know that there are people you can reach out to like Michelle and other support groups and don't try and do this by yourself. There's no right, wrong way to do it. It's on your time frame, and it's all natural part of it. So, you know, you're not alone and there's a lot of help there. And Michelle, you are one of those wonderful people that people can go for help. So thank you so much for being here. Again, you can get the book and all other information about Michelle at thewidowguide.com. I'm going to put that link down below. So it will be on the podcast as well. And Michelle, I want to thank you so much for being here and for all that you're doing to put positive energy into the world and to help others with something that was a part of your experience and very painful that you're paying that forward to help others is one of the most beautiful things I can think of. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You and are welcome. Out. Come to thewidowguide.com and tell me what you think. Yes, absolutely, you guys. So um, if you have any questions, again, askadeathdoula at gmail.com. My name is Suzanne O'Brien. This is the beginning of our Good Grief segment about grief and bereavement to help people in healing that part of our lives and doing it the best way that we possibly can. Michelle Hoffman, thank you again for being here, and I'll see you all on the next episode. Thank Bye, you so everybody. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.